this is Christian and welcome. In this video, I'll be talking about the asynchronous operations in JavaScript. So let's see what that's all about. And JavaScript is known as a uh, single threaded language, right? What that means is that if you think about a train on a track, so the train is that thread, that main thread, if you talk about the main thread in JavaScript. And that main thread or the, thing, the main train is responsible for moving information from one place to another place. So if you are on this train and you want to move, go from one point A to point B, and that could be your first stop or your tenth stop, it doesn't matter, right? To get there, you are pretty much um, uh, relied on this train here to get you there. So if there's anything that causes the train to stop along the way, then you're out of luck. You may not reach there or you may re reach at a later time. And when something blocks the train from moving forward, we say that it is a blocking the thread, right? So it's quite common in JavaScript, by the way. And so you want to prevent that. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't have multi-threaded um, processes like other languages like Java and C and C++ and so on. So these languages are multi-threaded. So again, the analogies here, analogy here would be if you have a lot of trains on multiple tracks, and their jobs, of course, are to basically deliver that message or those messages to what they're supposed to deliver. And uh, because there are more trains, they can do, do it more efficiently. Okay, so uh, to um, you know help JavaScript to kind of combat this or overcome this, JavaScript relies heavily on some very important web APIs that comes with the browsers. Okay, so remember that the engine in the browser is the JavaScript engine. But on the web browser itself, you have your own programs, right? It's a software itself that communicates directly with the server. So just to put that into perspective. But anyways, these are some APIs that you've probably seen. Um, Ajax is one of the very first uh, APIs out there back in the uh, mid '90s when it was created, I guess, uh, to you know allow us to transfer or move data from one server to another server or from the server to the front end and back and forth and there's some limitation to this but uh, it was very very uh, handy very useful and the reason why the X gets stuck in there is because of XML and again back at the time XML was the de facto data format for uh, use for transferring data nowadays it's more on uh, JSON right so uh, that's what the name got stuck in there but anyways you can see some of these different technologies you can use to kind of send uh, some of this information out to a different track, if you will, so that the main track on your JavaScript program runs continuously, okay? So we'll see some of these in action in a little bit. And uh, so Java Runtime Engine comes in every browser that you use. They have their own name, of course, like Google Chrome uses what's called a V8 engine, Firefox uses SpiderMonkey, Chakra for Edge or IE, and JavaScript Core for Safari. Opera uses Caracon and so on. Okay, so each of these engines inside the uh, JS engine it has something kind of similar in nature. What we call a event loop. Okay, so this diagram is in, in no ways a complete uh, specification for this um, uh, event loop. I'm just showing you a very broad overview of what's really happening under the hood. So you can get a, a sense of uh, understanding what's happening and also how you understand how asynchronous works behind the scene, right? So here we have at the left side is the client. The client could be your browser, could be another uh, program that is uh, communicating with your web pro application. And then in this orange box here is the main thread, the JS runtime, right? It runs on this main thread. So every time you open a browser, you open a new tab, you have this thing going on continuously. And inside this JS runtime, you have a event loop. This is uh, it's a loop that runs continuously every cycle. Um, uh, it's, it's also measured in one tick or sometimes called a one poll for polling. And so it receives information from the events, right? These are like a click event, uh, you know, uh, mouse events, uh, keyboard events, or if you're on a mobile device, it would be like swipe and pinch and all those stuff, all those events, or even some other events from a data source. Um, uh, to to API REST APIs, and when it receives those information, then depending on that type of event, um, the event here has a single what we'll call single stack or call stack. This call stack here tracks all the information is is specifically function calls that you call, and um, it it pushes those functions to your stack, 
and so which is why you see that when you run your code if you have an error somewhere in your code if you use the um, web browser tool to tell you it will say oh it's here here and so at this stack you see the call stack it has a list of all your functions right in that order and and it, it tells you exactly where you started make the function call and it propagates to exactly what the error is so it's through this call stack so here if I call a function called f of x and inside f of x has uh, some information that I would print to the console it will add those to your call stack until these if it's a, uh, a message that it needs to process right away it will process that and then removes that from the stack and then if there are no more information and then it removes this function all the stack and then goes with the next one okay in that sequence in that order so uh, because whatever you pushes to the stack gets execute last this is uh, performing a this operation known as a LIFO or last in first out right the last in here and the top always get executed first uh, however when you run into a, uh, a function that um, will allow the event loop to move this data off to a new it's like moving into a different track these functions are very commonly used uh, two of the most important functions you will be using are called set timeout and set interval of course the others as well called set immediate and so on or these are used to make what we call asynchronous calls because now what this does is it will when it sees this function it tells the uh, browser or the engine that hey move this information here delay this until a later time so if you delay that information and move it to another area or another truck if you will we call that the message queues okay so over here is a queue so a queue is different from a stack right queue means first in first out so whichever receives the information first gets uh, pumped out to the uh, back to the loop here okay so it will uh, delay that information and while that's being delayed or being processed on a separate track so in this example here is like it's mimicking this multi-threading program which JavaScript doesn't have. Um, again, this is a part of the uh, browser. Okay, it's it supports this system here. And so, while this information is being pushed to the message queue, while it's doing its job over here, this event loop keeps pulling information, keeps doing its task. Again, fetching data. If there's any, if it's none, it just keep waiting, pulling until it receives this message back, and then send that off to the client. Okay, so this is kind of what happening behind the scene here. All right. So uh, let's go take another, uh, see another diagram here. Uh, we'll see the code here first. For example, if I have a piece of JavaScript code on the left, this is a code um, you may, you know, uh, write. On the right side is the result or the output of this code here. I'm just showing here whatever I put in the console log you will see on the right side. So uh, the three statements I put in purple here are just a reference to uh, tell you that these are you know put on a separate track okay so when you run this code from top to bottom at a very single tick as you as you start a program it starts a single tick so that's the first cycle this is what happens right it runs out this entire list of code on a single tick and anything that's in purple here it will push that off to a separate tick or a separate time and at least one tick behind okay in this case i'm setting to a uh, this is measured in milliseconds, uh, 2,000 milliseconds or 2 seconds, 3.5 seconds, one more here for a 1 second. Okay. So when you run down this code from sequence from top to bottom, uh, this line here doesn't do anything. I just do an assignment. So we're not outputting that to the console. This line here is the g of x. It's a function call. We invoke a function down here right, to print that g of x to the screen. So that runs right away. That's the first thing that happens. And then it runs to the next line, set timeout. It tells the engine, the browser, hey, send that off to the back. You know, do that at a later time. When do we do it? After this time runs out. Okay. Remember that when you start this program, the timer starts right away. It goes at a constant time. It won't stop. So from time, from T0, all these things happen. Okay. But this one here says, okay, run this after two seconds pass run this then run this after three and a half seconds and then this is nested inside the f of x okay so we'll get there and then so these two are pushed to the next cycle or, or beyond and then it gets to this line uh this one here runs right away so you print that out and then these are just functions so they are doing nothing here and then you're done here the first tick 
Then the second tick comes along, nothing happens because now we're waiting for these timers here. So this is two seconds. This is uh, sooner than this one. So this is going to run. And when that runs, when we reach a two second mark, it's going to call the f of x function. It goes down here and we load this f of x to the console. So now when you start this function, the timer in here, it has its own internal timer. But again, this timer here is not a separate timer from the uh, the main timer. It still depends on the timer. So the overall timer here, even though I call the next timeout here, is, it says 1,000 second. This 1,000 second here is still measured against the total time from the beginning here. So if you add this together, the 2,000 plus the 1,000 here is total 3,000 or 3 seconds. Because 3 seconds is still sooner than the 3.5 seconds. So that means this is going to run first before this one does, even though this was run call first. Okay, so anyway, so the f of x will get invoked and it runs that out here. And then it runs the h of x because that is sooner than the three and a half. So you get that out to the f of x, h of x here. And then finally, when we reach the three and a half seconds, then g of x runs and we get that out to the console. So you see the order here is complete out of order uh, from your code here because you're running on a separate track, separate time. I guess it's easy to think of it that way. Right, so this is a really important concept to understand asynchronous when you make asynchronous calls. And because you're running code asynchronously, you prevent your JavaScript code from breaking or from uh, blocking, it's the correct term I'm going to use here. Okay, because it's not blocking, therefore your user will never see uh, um, uh, these information so they don't get, they get uh, um, you know, uh, distracted or get uh, uh, annoyed by your program being, you know, stalled. So uh, let's take a look at another diagram to see in, in, in visually. So here again, I have that same uh, similar uh, information here. One cycle is one tick, or sometimes it's called a pole. So each of these blocks measures the constant time in milliseconds. I put here T0 in a thousand at a 1,000 millisecond, 2,000 and 3,000 and so on. So here is just time in seconds. It runs continuously. In each second, you have a, an, a, a certain number of cycles or ticks that runs through here. I put three here just to show you what it is, but really there are more than that, okay? So uh, he's, these are the functions. I put them here on a separate track. They run their own, their, uh, their own time. And then down here on the bottom is the actual code and the very first tick. So the first tick, we run these because these are not, you know, put off on a delay, right? But when you make the um, uh, set time on for f of x, this one here is put on a separate track. It says wait until the two second time mark. So when these are already ran, so these are already ran and they exist in memory. And then when we run this and this, we compare the two timers. Well, f of x runs first because it reaches the two timer, 2000 time, timer uh, uh, second first. So it runs f of x. It prints what it needs to be printed. And inside that we have a nested uh, timer to run h of x. So it will then call this function, and this one runs, but it will wait until 1,000 seconds, right, from here on. So if you add this together, 2,000 plus 1,000, it will not execute until it reaches a 3,000 second time mark. So at this point, this one runs already. It executes while, you know, g of x is still waiting until the 3.5 seconds. Okay, so um, this is get, can get really tricky. So if you were able to write asynchronous programming is it's really complex to understand and you can you know um, you can you can really get a lot of headaches for doing that because you once you're off the main thread you have to find a way to come back to the main thread again and that is one of the challenges that um, uh, programmers have to deal with when you write asynchronous code but for us we don't have to worry about that we just basically use what's already given uh, things like Ajax and uh, uh, fetch and uh, you know um, the egg uh, the uh, other other methods that we can use, their promises and things like that. So they're already created for us to use. Okay, so I will stop here. I hope this is kind of give you a um, this kind of give you a uh, overview of what uh, is happening behind the scene when you run your code uh, next time on ja using JavaScript. In the next video, I'll do a little demo to run this code so you can see what's really happening in live code. If you have any questions, please let me know.